the Popcorn Junkies. Um, we're a little bit late with this review. This film came out, I think, two weeks ago now. Um, and weirdly, uh, whilst I had a mental note to go and see it, it's just one of those films that never sort of muscled its way to the front of the, the front of the queue, in a sense. This is a film called Rye Lane. This is uh, this is a British film. It's a rom-com. It's a rom-com directed by Rain Alan Miller uh, and written by Nathan uh, Bryan and Tom Melia. I hope that's correctly pronounced. Or Melia, 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 Melia. As I say, this is a rom-com, and I think before we get going talking about it, it's set principally across a day. Not exactly, and in a weird way, I wish it had been just literally contained within a day. But it, it has resonances and it has sort of aspects to it that uh, remind me, and you'll understand why, of the trilogy of films that starred Julie Delpy and, or Julie Delphi is Julie Delpy, uh, and Ethan Hawke, uh, before Sunrise, before Sunset, before Midnight, where essentially the films directed by Richard Linklater are sort of a couple, or a potential couple, or a once-been couple, walking, talking, riffing about romance, their lives, you know, the, their loves, their losses, all that kind of stuff. And this film kind of follows a similar trajectory. As I say, it's a rom-com. I'm not a fan of the rom-com. I mean, a, rom a romantic comedy has to work particularly hard with me for it to be funny. I mean, it's why I used to, before all the kind of, you know, uh, controversy, I used to like Woody Allen films because you would often get sort of romantic, well, there were rom often romantic comedies, think of Annie Hall. When Harry Met Sally, a particularly powerful rom-com that I really liked. So this is very much in rom-com rom -com territory. It's very British. It's set within and around Rye Lane, obviously Peckham Rye. Uh, it intercepts areas that we know so well, like West Norwood, Brixton, and such like. And I, I think somewhere online there's actually a map showing you where the film kind of goes, all the locations of the film. I mean, right down to in West Norwood, there's, you know, those ghost signs from the 1950s of old sort of adverts and old shops. There's a Bovril sign. They even, they even film there. So it's the story of Dom and Yaz. It starts in a in an art gallery, brilliant art gallery, with a really pretentious artist. So it sends up art, which is really neat. I think played by Simon Magnonda. Um, and you get a sense, it starts actually with uh, the boy, Dom, crying uncontrollably in a toilet at this gallery, at this art show. Um, and the girl next to him is having a wee. And what I liked quite quite early on from this is they weren't afraid to include the sound of, a, of our lead female character pissing. Uh, as a big piss. It kind of reminded me of Nadia's. Sorry about that. Um, so that was neat. Um, this is an incredibly formal, brightly coloured film. When I saw the trailer, I thought, mm, could this be a sort of TV sort of film? You know, often British cinema often feels like it would do, or it's made with a televisual sense of screen size scope visuals. I was blown away and surprised by how incredibly visual and how in, there was a sort of nice grade and grain to the kind of to the camera work as well to the to, to the footage. Primary colour, brilliantly shot, nice symmetry, a sort of symmetry to things. Not Wes Anderson because the film isn't like Wes Anderson at all, but that sort of symmetry I really like. Um, it uses location, it exploited the location of what essentially to the outside world, South East London, is considered a pretty deprived and smashed up part of London. And really, this film, Dom, our lead character, has just come out of a relationship. He meets at the gallery and they start to chat and talk and sort of hook into each other's day in the life, if you like. Uh, a character called Yaz. Dom is played by David Johnson. Yaz is played by Vivian Opara. I believe, I hope that's how you pronounce her surname, Opara. And the two of them, it's about them unpacking in a sense, the relationships they've had, certainly the relationship Dom's had, um, his upset, his heartache, his heartbreak. Um, there are neat little flashbacks to scenes and moments when things went wrong and, and, and you know, when he sort of the dick pick. And there's a very funny moment where if effectively his ex-girlfriend has left him and, and sort of gone off with his best friend. I mean, imagine that. Uh, and uh, a dick, he, he finds a dick pic on her, on her camera from his best friend to his girlfriend. Uh, but there are very funny moments where that sort of under cut by the fact that he knows he's got he knows it's his dick his best friend's dick because they used to piss up the walls when they were in the urinal and there's a very 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 funny sequence around that this is very funny in parts it's very funny i think a particular shout out has to go to go out to benjamin sarpon brony who plays the friend of dom who hooks up with dom's ex-girlfriend he is brilliantly stupid brilliantly naive you know potentially a character that is defined by toxic masculinity and yet it's totally sent up by the script and emasculated in a sense because he's stupid and he's sort of obsessed with muscles and even when someone insults him, he takes it as a compliment. And so this becomes a film about Dom and Yaz slowly, essentially, not necessarily falling in love, but stepping towards each other. 
I was getting lots of vibes, certainly around the way it was shot. There's some lovely sort of what I call transitional shots, where you know you, they're walking from one scene to another, and in a sense, to kind of elide that movement, you would go to just sort of a shot. I don't know, like West Norwood High Street, or Rye Lane, or markets down in Brixton, or what have you. And it would be sort of what normally you wouldn't look at and think this is a visual cinematic thing, but the camera work in this, and the structuring of it, and the colours, and the set—it's well, not even set design. This is real life. You know, they would frame sort of graffiti on you know shutters in front of shops. There was a vibrancy to it, and what I liked about that is too often we get films that are set in South London or in deprived areas where you know print, the, the population is principally black um, and it, it's only obsessed with the sort of deprivation it's only interested in a sense something they call poverty porn the difficulties the the lack of kind of gentrification and all that and what I liked about this was this found because Brixton don't get me wrong the huge swathes of South East London are gentrified and continue to be gentrified this found what I, I felt to be an authentic sense of what places like Brixton and Peckham etc are and have always been for their local communities. So in a sense you weren't looking at this footage thinking oh that's bashed up, oh look at the graffiti, oh look that's quite a tatty old sign above the shop. You looked at it through renewed eyes and you thought hang on this is community, this is, these are the interlinked chain, chains of of, of a diverse multicultural community. And so you'd have like static shots of like men playing games underneath a bridge, you know, somewhere like, uh, I don't know, uh, Loughborough Junction. You would have a woman sort of standing in the street in her African dress, kind of, I don't know what she was doing, waiting for a bus or singing or doing something. And these transitional shots, I just thought were beautiful. And they really put me in mind of that classic Spike Lee film, Do the Right Thing which is about this seething summer of heat and how a riot is almost brewing and breeding because of the heat and the Italian community are up against the, uh, you know, Amer black American community and it's all the argy-bargy and how they're actually going to fight amongst themselves rather than against the circumstances they're in. But the amazing thing about this film, you know, it features a principally black cast. It isn't about being black. And I was talking to the girls about this. The only other film I can think of in recent years where we've said something similar is a film called Waves, which is a brilliant American film about a young um, sort of sports man, but he's a young boy, who has such a terrible injury that he can't play. And it's about how, in a sense, his life kind of implodes and falls apart because he can't pursue his, his sporting dreams. That film was not at all about what it meant to be black in America, which, let's face it, uh, is a big enough subject to keep exploring. They just happen to be a black family. And what I loved about this film, set in South East London, it wasn't about being black. It wasn't about a black experience. That's not to say it's all about the black experience. It's all about the community. It's all about the kind of, I'm sure there are so many sort of in jokes there that just a white middle class male of my age would never ever actually comprehend. But this was just about people falling in love. This was just about people. This was just about how they interrelated to each other. And not once was there the sense that because they were black, any of their experiences were somehow being impinged upon or affected some laugh out loud moments. There's a moment where uh, Don ends up going to Yaz's, I think it's her aunt, or is it her mum? I can't remember, but they're gay, um, which is, <laughs> I love that detail. Again, just matter of fact, they're all in the back garden, having a barbecue, listening to music. Very funny scene where one of the guys at the barbecue is sort of like, you know, grilling Dom about what's on his Spotify. And, you know, Dom's kind of saying it's grime, it's trap, it's kind of, you know, it's all this dark kind of, you know, cool dance music. And then they hit play and actually Terence Trent Darby comes on. And actually when Terence Trent Darby came on, I was like, I want to find that tune. I want to find that tune. It was good. Um, so, you know, really neat, funny set pieces. It's an incredibly short film. I think it clocks in at only 82 minutes. I don't use this word often about films. This was charming. And I think in this incredibly cynical sort of cinematic landscape where so many films and so much content is about was cyn about cynicism and and as I say about the difficulties of living rather than the joys of living and of course there, there's difficulty in this because he's been dumped by his girlfriend um like you know but there are just wonderful moments of brevity and lightness of touch and this is an absolute tribute to the script writers and the director what a top team and I think we can absolutely see them uh being sort of fired into the stratosphere of British British filmmaking this is one of those films that benefited entirely from being like budget. It benefited entirely from treating its landscape, the location, treating its characters with warmth, respect and humour. Um, I really believed in their sort of burgeoning romance. I, I loved the two actors very much. You fell in love with them. 
you found their little flashbacks really neat. Sometimes those flashbacks don't work, but there was a real sort of surrealism and quirkiness to the way in, the way in which certain scenes were, were dealt with. You know, right down to his artist friend, how you know his first exhibition was about teeth or lips, and then his next ex exhibition was about butts, and then he's at the he's at the exhibition saying, you know what, someone was telling me the other day we should really do one about feet. You know, it takes an arched eye at certain things. But again, you know, even the kind of artist and the, the idea of dealing with art, that, that too, you know, often presented as the preserve of sort of pretentious white people. I thought that was brilliantly done too. I don't want to ruin it. There's, there's well, there's one cameo with a particularly uh, well-known foodie person. And then there's another cameo which I thought was a really charming addition, very low key, uh, very sort of unexpected, uh, very un-egotistical, unshowy, and that was just a nice touch. It was a nice kind of, I felt, broad gesture to the history or the, uh, the tradition, if you like, of British cinema. I think this film marks a shift and a change or a potential shift and change in British filmmaking. I get sick to death of those things like, I mean, I haven't seen it, but you know, things like Hallelujah, um, what was it, S Something on the Run, whatever that film was, which was like a whodunit. This is the kind of comedy I want to see British cinema making. And I love the fact that I was entirely shocked and surprised by how this was a film and not a TV piece or a piece that would have done better going on television, which is what I often end up feeling with so many British films. This was cinematic, it had its own language, the performances were understated, it didn't mind sort of sitting still for a bit, and it didn't feel even in its length like this was a short film that had been souped up into a longer film. I thought the device of it being within a day, though, as I say, there's a slight quibble that it kind of, I think it reached over just slightly to the next day. But again, a lovely device. It, it's a nice limiting device and it worked really well. I would fully recommend going to see this film. Go and see it at the cinema because it is a British cinematic British film. I mean, Empire of Light was, but my God, what a load of old self-indulgent nonsense the rest of it was. This is just a brilliant film. This is about youngsters. This is youngsters with a sense of humour. This is this this tugs away from that whole idea that youngsters are just sort of flecked through with just mental health crises, just bad behaviour, getting up to no good. This isn't. These are two smart young people who slowly fall in love. Fully recommend it. I would give this a whopping. No, I'd give this a hundred. I'd give this a hundred for what it is. It's it's it's, it's a rom com. I mean, when I haven't seen a rom com that I've enjoyed this much in years. <laughs>